Hey everybody, welcome to the Pipeline Integrity Show. I'm your host, Hussein Fidel. We just finished off an informative interview with Jordan Dubuque from OneBridge Solutions, where we discuss data science and machine learning in the world of pipeline integrity. I hope you enjoy this interview and see you soon. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to the Pipeline Integrity Show. This week our theme is data science and machine learning in the world of pipeline integrity and our honored guest is Jordan Dubuque from OneBridge Solutions. Jordan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So Jordan, before we uh, get into all the questions, could you start us off with an introduction please? Yeah, so again, my name is Jordan Dubuque. I'm the CTO of a company called OneBridge Solutions. Uh, I've been doing software development uh, for close to 20 years now, mostly kind of web applications, uh, kind of doing the whole cloud computing thing before it really became a, a household term. Uh, and then OneBridge, uh, we started about five years ago with an opportunity to partner with Microsoft as part of what they call their Azure Machine Learning Accelerator Program. Uh, our company was selected from a group of hundreds of applicants from all over the world and kind of whittled down to a very small number of, uh, of companies that were accepted into the program. And there we worked closely with Microsoft engineers to develop uh, a platform for data science and machine learning around pipeline integrity data. Our solution is called Cognitive Integrity Management. It's a cloud-based app that helps operators manage the kind of the complete life cycle of their integrity programs. It starts from kind of scheduling and planning your assessment activity and inspections, moves on to analysis of all kinds of integrity data like ILI, CIS, NDE and field data, uh, pipe properties, construction information, that kind of stuff. Um, from there, it helps operators produce their dig plans and dig packages for their, their field operators operations. And then finally, uh, you know, it helps you kind of monitor any active threats through to mitigation and plan your next reinspection. Re um, so today we're working with dozens of operators uh, and the platforms in use by over 200 uh, integrity professionals now to just help manage their programs. Excellent, thank you for that introduction. So why don't we start off with uh, some definitions and some terms, because I think in the world of pipeline integrity, you know, we're, we seem to always be about uh, 50 years behind everybody else. Uh, so uh, can you define things like, what, what do we mean when we say data science, machine learning, neural networks? If you could uh, explain some of these terms for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're really hoping to, to bring that, that 50 year lag up quite a bit. That's, uh, that's really our goal. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about those terms and, uh, you know, I can share kind of what they mean from our perspective and, and from the industry perspective. Um, you know, these are all kind of subtopics under the umbrella of, you know, what we call artificial intelligence, right? Machine learning is obviously kind of one of the, the forefront pieces of, of that ecosystem. I would say machine learning is a form of artificial intelligence where a system or a computer program is designed to learn on its own without any human intervention. So, you know, a typical example of machine learning would be where we have a, a training set of like labeled data and for a given set of inputs, someone's already determined kind of the desired answer, the desired output from that. So then machine learning is, an, is a way of kind of working backwards from that desired output to the, to the input data and establishing a set of criteria or a system for deriving that output as closely as possible. So, you know, to me, the classic example is like a collection of photos of like dogs and cats where someone has manually grouped them into, you know, each, which animals in each photo. And we can train a machine learning model to effectively learn or, or to derive a method for determining which animal is in which photo given a, a, a new photo that wasn't part of the training set. Typically, you know, this is about recognizing patterns. Uh, in some cases, these patterns might not even be known to any, any human being that's working on the problem. It might be something that, you know, just can be derived through that kind of brute force approach of developing a model. Thanks for that. Uh, so, you know, what problem does uh, machine learning and data science solve? So, you know, a lot of the times in, in sales, I guess they'll say, you know, don't sell the product, sell the solution. So 
um, you know, I can, I can definitely being in the industry, there's so many problems with our data and, you know, we have these files in our folders and there's so many Excel spreadsheets, but if you can talk a little bit about, you know, what problem does AI, uh, sorry, does machine learning and data science solve? Yeah, so we've, we find that um, these tools are really well suited to problems that involve kind of big data, where the scale of the data set is too large for any kind of manual approach to be practical. Um, you know, in the, in, you know, kind of in industry, you know, in, in many of these examples, the manual approach could could often only consider a, a limited scale of data. So, you know, typical approaches that we see are filtering things down to a point where, you know, a kind of human uh, can can analyze and, and work with the data at that scale. Machine learning and data science and such is all about really incorporating more of the available data into making a decision or a determination uh, based on that data. So. You know, machine learning, it can commonly be applied to problems like uh, like classification, where you're trying to group information into categories to organize information uh, or even to make sort of binary decisions like a pass fail, accept, reject, you know, kind of condition. Um, it can also be useful for making predictions. Uh, so, for example, by training a machine learning model based on sort of past conditions and then the outcomes that resulted from those conditions. Uh, machine learning can be really accurate, surprisingly accurate, at forecasting an outcome based on kind of similar conditions and then what has resulted from those things in the past. So as you can imagine, you know, this has all kinds of practical applications like uh, the common ones that we hear about are, uh, for example, in healthcare, where machine learning it can help medical professionals diagnose issues, uh, health issues earlier on, more accurately, that kind of thing. And then, you know, we see it in kind of our day to day lives, right? Um, you know, things like uh, product recommendations is a is a popular one that I always think about. Uh, you know, when I go onto Amazon or, you know, online stores, all of the kind of recommendations and things like that that are surfaced are typically being driven by some kind of machine learning application. Excellent. So <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, pipeline integrity, so how, how does uh, data science and machine learning apply there? So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, we have these huge uh, inline inspections, so, sort of the uh, backbone of our data gathering uh, activity. So when we, you know, get thousands of kilometers of um, inline inspection data, and then we have NDE data, we have CP data. Can you talk about how uh, machine learning can sort of digest all that data and uh, do something valuable and productive with it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one of the places that my team and OneBridge started is from that kind of data ingestion, normalization and, and organization standpoint. So that's an area where we've definitely seen that machine learning and similar uh, technologies can can help. So in our case, we have a machine learning classifier that we've trained to understand First, the structure of these data sets, you know, the different ILI tally formats and vendor reporting formats and things like that to interpret the, that wide variety of, of structure into a standard, right, into one sort of canonical representation of that data. And then also to classify things like, uh, say, ILI feature types or anomaly classifications into, again, a standardized taxonomy. So what we find working with operators, you know, in that area is that they have a rich ILI history, typically across many vendors, different standards, different data formats and things like that. To, to even get to the point of being able to use that data in interesting ways, you first have to kind of level the playing field, make it into some kind of apples to apple structure that you can then leverage for uh, more interesting work. So some examples of the more interesting work then that become possible are around things like um, alignment. So the ability to kind of take that linear data, that spatial data, identify patterns in that data now that things have kind of been put into an apples to apples kind of structure and to match them up uh, in terms of geometry. So there's lots of data in pipeline integrity, GIS systems, pods and asset data 
ILI, you mentioned cathodic protection, hydrostatic testing, NDE and repair data sets. The data is typically spread across all these different systems and silos. Um, they all use different linear and spatial referencing systems, and it's very often like difficult to move between them, right? So an algorithmic approach to data alignment can use kind of mutually visible features across these different systems. We can use pattern recognition, which allows you know, a system to kind of integrate these independent pieces of data together into a spatially normalized fashion. And that allows kind of an apples to apples comparison now over say the ILI history, over you know, ILI data versus what's in the GIS versus what's coming in your cathodic protection surveys and things like that. From there, it's possible to kind of develop a corrosion growth model uh, by looking at how, say, metal loss anomalies are changing over time after they've been spatially aligned and you can connect that history, the lineage of each anomaly. We can kind of use that as a tool to forecast its, its future growth. Um, there's an opportunity to do all kinds of um, calculations and things like that, you know, around pressures and, and that kind of thing on top of that data. Um, it's also possible to use machine learning to establish sort of confidence intervals in things like ILI measurements. And so we've done some experiments and we, there's research out there to look at things like how inline inspection tool velocity, uh, anomaly dimensions, orientations, pipe properties like wall thickness, grade and diameter affect the accuracy of ILI measurements and that kind of thing. Uh, we recently put out a, a paper through IPC actually in Calgary uh, just a little while ago uh, on what we call repair fraction. And in that case, what we did is we developed a machine learning model to try to predict repair outcomes. So, you know, what we find is that very often the digs and repair activity that's selected by the integrity group, you know, it, it results in a positive repair only some percentage of the time. And, you know, in the remaining portion of the time, sometimes the field just doesn't identify what they were sent there to find or what they find is different than what was expected. So it's possible to use machine learning to try to predict that outcome and to try to guide operators toward those more productive digs. Um, finally, there's some research that we've been looking at and doing some work on on our own around things like the ability to identify uh, SCC. So for example, where ILI vendors call things like crack fields and possible SCC type conditions, very often, you know, when you go excavate them, you're not finding anything like SCC. So, you know, is there an opportunity to use machine learning or, or similar technologies to try to identify those positive SCC cases from those, those false positives? Ultimately, you know, the goal is really just to help operators perform fewer digs that aren't required to focus the attention on the things that do need attention and really just to help operators prevent and predict pipeline failures completely. Excellent. So that was a thank you so much for that. Uh, I, you've prompted me f with uh, three questions. So mm -hmm. uh, first you mentioned, uh, you know, the um, issues around uh, the taxonomy and the nomenclature in the different ILIs and the different NDE reports. Um, so would you, I mean, no, no doubt it'd be quite a, uh, uh, you know, large task to um, try and uh, normalize all that data, try and uh, make it, you know, all seamless in terms of the, the wording and all that. What kind of effort do you see around that? And uh, do, do, you, do you think, it's something that can be done in one shot, something that needs to be done over time. How, how best can a company go about, because there would be thousands of, well, thousands of hundreds, maybe tens of hundreds of uh, previous ILIs and you have different NDE vendors. What kind of effort does that look like to especially go back historically and uh, sort of normalize all the, the wording and, 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 the, and all, you know, all, the, all the information that people have? Yeah, so there there is a pretty significant effort there, you know, just in trying to first understand the kind of landscape of the data, what those those variations are and things like that. 
to to then try to identify kind of a common denominator, right? Your your standard that you're hoping to kind of homogenize everything into. And then comes the work of, you know, sort of training the model to be able to identify in each of those varieties, you know, what what are the classifications and decisions that you would want to make, you know, given those inputs. So we've actually been working on that problem for a couple years. We have a really, you know, within OneBridge, a really advanced kind of uh, machine learning classification system that understands uh, it's been trained on actually almost 5000 ILI tally files and so it really understands a, a wide variety of different formats and structures and then we've taken things like the the, the manual work that uh, operators that we work with have done. We've taken things like input from subject matter experts, integrity engineers, etc. and fed that into that model as as training data point, you know, it becomes possible to have a, a pretty robust model that given a brand new untrained data set, it's able to kind of make sense of it, put it into the desired structure without much intervention. So the way I'd characterize it is that there's a bit of work to kind of get to that point. Once you have the volume of training data and a sufficiently advanced model, it becomes really quite straightforward. You can kind of throw your data into that model and most of the time you get out exactly what you're looking for. Right, so from the operator perspective in terms of effort, is, is it all that all they have to do is, you know, sit down with, for example, a com company like yourself, um, look at perhaps what the different vendors they've used over time and then maybe make like a nomenclature conversion or translation table. Um, is, is, that all, is that it or you really have to go back. You don't have to like go back into all the data and redo it or anything like that, right? Yeah. So, you know, the benefit of working with a, a company like ours, of course, is that we've kind of already done that, right? Uh, with the 5,000 ILI tallies, again, that make up the training set for our classifier, odds are we've encountered something very similar to just about any operator's data. And the good news right. is, in that case, you can leverage you know, the training that we've already done. You can just basically throw that data right into the model. You know, Typically, we would do this as part of our production trial process with an operator or something like that. And generally, things just work. Now, in some cases, like we're, we're actually starting to work with some international operators. They have ILI tallies in different languages and things like that. In those cases, we have to go back and do some additional training. We work with those subject matter experts and say, OK, can you help us understand, you know, what this field means? You know, what does this represent in our standardized model? What what is this anomaly type? What are we describing here? Is this some kind of lamination or crack like anomaly or something else? So hopefully that gives you a, an idea. Now, if an operator were to start kind of on their own, you know, they would probably take, you know, kind of the existing work that their integrity engineers and integrity professionals have done on their data, try to build a training set out of that and then work to develop, say, their own model. Um, you know, of course, I'm a bit biased, but uh, I do think working with somebody who's kind of put in this work already gives you a huge uh, head start on any of that. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, like I was saying, one of the biggest uh, hurdles that I think people think about when they see this is, uh, you know, I mean, what what a what a huge task we have to go and clean up everything historically, but then to find out that hold on, someone's already done this, uh, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Of course, it's a huge benefit. So the second the second question I had uh, is around what you mentioned about uh, the repair rate. I think that's a huge, huge uh, topic. And, uh, you know, it's almost like a bit of the, uh, you know, human versus the machine a little bit, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a good point in the fact that, you know, integrity engineers, we have our process and procedures and I almost think of it like the meat grinder, right? You put your ILI data through, you have your criteria digs based on your compliance or regulations. And then you, you uh, conduct your sort of growth-based analysis and maybe you have a few risk-based digs. Um, and to be honest, a lot of those digs, and, and nothing against the integrity engineers, of course, but a lot of those are programmed to, uh, you go out there and, and as we say, you know, biggest bang for the buck, um, <clears throat> you end up doing digs that uh, didn't, really, didn't really need it or could have sustained longer uh, time before needing a dig. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, that sort of conversion rate of and that predictive nature that machine learning can really help you uh, send you to those areas that really need uh, attention. 
Yeah. I, I love your analogy about the, the meat grinder. I think that's great. Um, yeah. I, so there's, there's always a balance between kind of efficiency of the dig program where on one extreme, you know, say 100% of your digs yield a repair. And 100% of the time when you go dig something, you find exactly what you had, had expected and it needs attention, right? That's kind of the, the maximum efficiency end of the spectrum. But of course, at the opposite end is is risk, right? And you know, sort of making sure that you're you have the right balance between those two things. So in reality, with the operators that we've worked with on this, we find that somewhere between 50 to 60 percent of the time, their digs are resulting in a positive repair, which leaves 40 to 50 percent of the time where that dig could have potentially been reallocated to a different a different anomaly a different situation that maybe could have been more likely probabilistically statistically to yield a positive repair and to be targeted toward an anomaly that needed attention so the question becomes how do you how do you sort the output of that meat grinder again to go back to the analogy into the sort of productive stuff versus the unproductive stuff while still keeping in mind the the appropriate balance for each operator in terms of that that risk. So by, you know, it really starts by measuring kind of where you're at today. Most operators that we talk to, they're not sure what percentage of their digs are actually required, you know, productive, et cetera. So that's something that we definitely help operators with is just to say, okay, well, given your, your field data that's coming back, here's where you are. Now, how does that compare to your peers and the industry at large and such? How does this feel, you know, in terms of your own tolerance for risk, your own needs in terms of that balance? etc and then it's kind of like once you know where you are you can start to identify opportunities to move that point on the spectrum depending on again the appetite for efficiency versus risk where you are relative to your contemporaries etc and certainly that's an area where machine learning can help it's uh you know it's one example of where a machine learning model can can help you identify things that might be surprising like every time you dig you know a particular type of feature in a particular region on a certain diameter of pipe you know you're you're doing worse than average and you could potentially improve that by just tweaking one of those variables in sometimes an unexpected way right no that's a that's an interesting point uh so it's almost like uh you know you can uh, a company can get to the point where they can say okay uh, okay, I know on in this geography, on this NPS size diameter of pipe, um, I w would like to add a little bit more fat in terms of conservatism because of the history on it. So I want to tweak up the uh, conservatism dial. And then on this section, okay, I know I'm okay. Typically, it would result in all these digs, but I know I, I'm okay. I'm making the decision where I want to tone down the conservatism and go more for just what's required. So it seems like there can be that kind of adjustment um, with uh, with a machine learning data science approach because it kind of displays that information to you so you can make that decision. Is that is that how it works? Absolutely, yeah. And maybe as a as follow-up uh, for your viewers, we, we published kind of our first work on this topic uh, at PPIM earlier this year in February. And so that's a paper that we had put out with that conference that kind of goes into some of these things. And what we showed there was a particular example of looking at historical digs, something like 20,000 digs uh, historically uh, across the data set that our data science team works with. And they were able to prove that by when we focus in on some digs that were driven by sort of a growth impetus, a growth criteria that drove those digs, um, we were able to to prove that by adding some additional criteria, like for example, a metal loss depth threshold to say, okay, even with a growth um, sort of prompt here, we're not going to dig anything less than X percent in terms of metal loss. We could move the needle on that ratio of dig efficiency. We could gain something like 40 or 50 digs reclaimed back into the pool that we could reallocate somewhere else and lose very few productive repairs. Now, of course, for some operators, 
the prospect of losing any productive repairs is not an option. So what we then kind of went on to prove is that by incorporating a pit to pit growth analysis of that anomaly, rather than just say a half life based growth or you know some other method of of deriving corrosion growth would uh, allow you to remove those digs without sacrificing any productive repairs. So it's a pretty significant example in terms of how data science, machine learning, just modern tools and approaches can help run a more efficient program and ultimately a safer program because by putting those digs back into the operator's pocket, they can go allocate those somewhere else, something that hopefully needs their attention. Perfect. So the third question I had there was, uh, you mentioned about uh, the inline inspection vendors and you mentioned the example of SCC, which I know is uh, sort of the you know, most famous uh, thread on the pipeline nowadays, everyone's talking about it since almost 10 years now and beyond. Um, you know, you, you've mentioned an important point that a lot of the times, especially with uh, first time crack runs, even follow up crack runs, uh, UT crack runs, whether that's EMAT or, uh, you know, UTCD, you know, a lot of the times we get calls which are, um, you know, we go and dig them, they're called as whatever 40, 50, 60 percenters, this length, this depth, you know, they add their tool tolerance is fine. But in the column, sometimes you'll see possible well trim or, you know, they're not sure. So you mentioned an interesting point where uh, you were suggesting that uh, machine learning and data science can, uh, I guess, take the learnings from NDE information and from previous digs, uh, look at that operator specifically, I guess, and almost aid in the process, assist in determining whether uh, those crack-like features are real or not, or in truly injurious, or you know what we're thinking versus whether it's just uh, you know, a stable lack of fusion. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, that's right. So specifically, uh, you know, we're doing some work on this topic, and there's also a paper uh, that I've seen that was published by Rosen uh, on the topic. And essentially what they showed is that by uh, building, developing a machine learning model around SCC, where you know essentially the vendors had indicated possible SCC crack field type features, things like that, and then subsequently there was an excavation done and either a positive or negative kind of truth, actual results in terms of whether SCC was was present. They then fed that into the model, you know, exactly as we kind of described earlier, and they they developed the model using features such as length, width, depth of the uh, called anomaly, orientation, diameter, linear location, these types of attributes, and they were able to prove that with some confidence they could predict that outcome of whether SEC would actually be identified in the field or not. And that's a really powerful tool, right? Like if, uh, if you have a lot of these types of features, it's kind of impractical to go excavate all of them potentially. So operators need to be selective about which ones truly need their attention, truly merit that excavation. And tools like machine learning have been, you know, now I think proven to be able to help operators make those decisions. Excellent, thank you. So. Let's move on a little bit to uh, discuss, uh, you know, you touched on it a little bit, uh, data organization. You know, for sure there's the predictive nature um, and the ability to learn. I think a lot of operators on the very basic level, on just step one, they struggle. And that is, like we were talking a little bit in the beginning, just data organization. They don't have a repository. They have pods. They're looking for different solutions. There's a few uh, inline inspection vendors that have their softwares. Um, you know, how does, what is, what is the best way, and I guess maybe if you can speak a bit about OneBridge, but, you know, how is the best way to organize all that information and not struggle with continuously having to fix that data, right? So, you know, I'm talking about weld matching, feature growth rates, feature IDs, because they change, the numbers change between vendors. Does a machine learning and a data science approach help sort of solve all those kind of data storage problems and does it give the ability to quickly uh, play with the data and, and extract it? Yeah, it, it definitely does help. I think, um, you know, we've seen the industry completely accept the idea that you need a integrity management data system. You need some kind of database, some kind of system uh, that 
you know, is the canonical representation of all your integrity data, your your system of record, etc. You know, we see operators, some operators developing these on their own, or typically that's been the approach in the past. Obviously, cognitive integrity management with OneBridge is another kind of take on that. I think there's a real benefit to having that system of record in the cloud, which is why we've taken that approach. You know, it really allows kind of that ubiquitous connectivity, uh, certainly during uh, the pandemic with people working remotely, et cetera. It's been, I think, very helpful for uh, the operators we work with to have kind of a cloud-based system that is accessible and connected, you know, even when their situations change and can be flexible in that regard. Machine learning and data science can help kind of get you there, you know, organize your unstructured data, turn it into a more structured kind of workable representation, make sense of it. As we discussed earlier, then the ability to kind of put it together in terms of patterns and things like that. You mentioned girth weld numbering. How do you how do you model your girth welds in a canonical way such that the same girth weld in every ILI tally in your you know, asset management system, et cetera, is all that same entity. Well, very often that's not trivial and you need tools like algorithmic alignment, pattern detection kind of systems that can say, okay, given these, these patterns of joint lengths and geometry, we can align these two data sets onto each other and we can be nearly certain that, you know, girth weld 17 in this data set is girth weld 462 in this other data set and kind of put those things together. So I think there's lots of opportunities in the realm of data science and machine learning to kind of help, you know, get to that, that great data system, that structured integrity data set uh, that I think the whole industry really recognizes that they they need. You know, the, the days of having hundreds of Excel files spread across network drives and things like that, you know, it's just, that's not the future. I think, uh, I think that much is clear. Right on. So let's move on to a little bit about the analytics and visualization. You know, nowadays we hear a lot about uh, softwares like Power BI and Tableau. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about uh, how to extract and present sort of the data, the narrative that the data is telling us. So, you know, a lot of the times, and like you're saying, the scale of the data is such that the human mind, or at least the typical human mind would struggle to recognize those patterns. And I almost feel like it takes multiple ILIs and digs for you to develop the personality of the, you know, of the pipeline. Um, how does AI, and sorry, how does machine learning and data science uh, sort of capture and present the narrative that the data is telling uh, from ILIs and digs? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I would say it's all about putting the data into context, right? A lot of what we do, and I, I think a lot of what the industry is trying to do, is to use the data to reconstruct the physical reality of what's actually happening on the pipeline over time, right? And we have a number of kind of you know, imperfect ways to do this, like ILI measurements and things like that. All of this is getting better over time, but there's still a lot of kind of inference and tolerances at play, imperfections in, in measurement accuracy, et cetera, that make it difficult to do this. But it really comes back to, to me, extracting that narrative is about, we call it um, constructing the digital twin the digital twin of that physical asset and in full fidelity or as much fidelity as possible what is happening physically in terms of corrosion growth in terms of SCC all the potential threats and everything that's relevant to the integrity of that asset as well as what's happening over time so again to me that's about having this structured data system having uh, pattern recognition systems, algorithms, other other data science technologies that can go beyond the typical human observation and that can be applied at scale, right? Because, you know, as we talked about, you know, that human intuition is irreplaceable and, and it, immensely valuable, but it can't be applied to everything, right? Eventually there's too much data that 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 alone doesn't work. You need a hybrid of the two where you have systems that can look at the entirety of the data and help you put it together. And then of course that subject matter expertise, that human intuition that is of the utmost importance when looking at you know, the things that are, are bubbling to the surface from that. 
So to me, that's really what it's about. Um, you mentioned things like Power BI, Tableau. Um, you know, business intelligence is another significant aspect of this. The ability to understand what's happening with the pipeline mostly from an integrity perspective, but clearly that also grows into sort of business decision making, uh, forecasting, things like that. Uh, I know that the operators we work with, they will use the tools that we provide to try to to try to think about things like acquisition and disposition of assets. When would you replace significant sections of a pipeline versus continuing to repair uh, individual anomalies, those types of things. So I think that's that's really the the whole story around that narrative. And the, you know, there's certainly a lot of opportunity here to help help operators understand what that is. Thanks for that. So can you give us an example of how uh, data science and machine learning uh, in, in, in real life, if you have an example of it, where it recognized the pattern that perhaps a typical human would not. Uh, I mean, you don't have to share the exact details, uh, you know, the client or whatever, but do you have any examples of a pattern that was recognized that basically would have never been recognized before um, that uh, machine learning picked up? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a few things we can point to. Um, you know, when we think about pattern recognition and, and the things that that again, my team is doing today, we kind of started from, you know, understanding the geometry that's represented in the inline inspection data and identifying patterns in that geometry, almost like, uh, you know, obviously in the girth welds, we look at things like joint lengths on a, on a pipeline, and it almost becomes like a fingerprint, right, that you can use to identify that pipeline. We go from there and start to look at the geometry of individual anomalies, and I think of those almost like, uh, like constellations, right, the different shapes and different patterns of the anomaly geometry, which you can then use to kind of orient yourself, right, like sailing by the stars uh, in another tally, and to identify kind of where those same anomalies are. So that's all examples of kind of pattern recognition in practice. Um, beyond that though, we have a couple additional algorithms that our data science team has developed to identify other types of, of corrosion and metal loss patterns that could indicate a broader problem in that area on the pipeline. And so a couple examples of that are that we have a pattern that attempts to identify potential areas of coating disbondment. So where the coating on the pipeline has disbonded from the pipe surface, and as a result, moisture, humidity, you know, other stuff is getting in between the pipe wall and the coating. And corroding away that section of the pipe. And so we can do that by trying to look for specific patterns and areas of increased metal loss, corrosion growth, et cetera, that are kind of characteristic of that. One more quick example is that um, we, uh, we have another pattern where we can identify essentially spiral corrosion patterns. And what you quickly realize is that these are following a spiral seam weld on spiral seam welded pipe, right? And so that's another example of where it can be difficult to identify, say, seam weld corrosion and, and issues around that seam on spiral pipe, but by having a pattern detection algorithm that can look for these corrosion and metal loss patterns that have a spiral like characterization becomes possible to identify those types of threats. So it gives you a, a couple examples, a couple ideas of the possibilities there. Perfect. So uh, another item you were mentioning was the cloud. And I just want you to I just want to explore a little bit about um, you know the shared learning aspect you know without sharing sensitive data so can you speak to how uh, machine learning and data science is able to take the learnings almost from any operator that's involved but the security aspect that you know there's no fear about uh, data leaks or anything that you know we hear about nowadays yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the reasons we we partnered with Microsoft right from the beginning on this is because, uh, you know, they have a, a very robust cloud platform. And, you know, I, I would say one of the most secure cloud platforms available. So data security is kind of of the utmost importance to us. And, uh, you know, we always uh, want to ensure that operator data is is protected and private, never, never shared, et cetera. Now that said, you know, machine learning uh, and these types of, of technologies, they effectively get smarter and more capable as more data is incorporated. So what we do is that we, we do utilize 
all of the operators data that we work with in training and developing models, in developing algorithms, uh, integrity conditions, and really the, the capability of the whole platform grows with the participation of more operators, along with their feedback, their best practices, uh, things like that. But of course, through that, individual operator data always remains in their possession, their control. It's never shared. Um, really, you know, the entire industry kind of benefits when operators work together to, to try to improve these things. For sure, yeah, I think that's a huge, huge benefit because, uh, you know, I, I, you, we talk about uh, in a department, you know, you might have uh, people with 10, 15, 20 years experience and sometimes you'll see people say, oh, we have about 200 years of experience on this team and what I guess they mean is they're summing up the the, eight, the years of experience of each person and then you think about what you just said and say, well, w what about if you had 5,000 years of experience, right? with that kind of brain looking at your data looking at diff who's looked at different ILIs who's looked at the results of those NDE digs you're getting that brain to look at uh, your data for you and it only just keeps on getting more and more and more intelligent as the participation increases so it's a really fascinating uh, concept so uh, you know let's talk about um, some of the limitations of data science and machine learning uh, you know like with, with with anything, what can it do? What it what can it not do? Uh, can you you know especially in terms of that predictive nature? I think there might be some miscon misconceptions of people thinking that uh, it will tell you you know dig here, dig there, dig here. So mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit about the you know what it can do, what it can't do, what are its limitations, and uh, uh, you know what is the appropriate and best way uh, that we can use machine learning and data science? Yeah, so I think we we see kind of a lot of misconceptions around, you know, AI and these types of, of topics, right? Um, you know, even something like uh, like Tesla's autopilot, right? Is the idea that you can go to sleep in your car? Definitely not yet, right? Uh, so, you know, at least today and for the foreseeable future, you know, this, this kind of technology is not a replacement for human experience, human intuition, that subject matter expertise, et cetera. You know, as, as you kind of mentioned just now, lots of, you know, extremely talented uh, professionals in the industry, lots of knowledge and experience. You know, part of what we do is just trying to make the most of that. And, you know, as, as each operator has this kind of uh, immense knowledge to kind of share that you know with the broader industry and to make it accessible so our goal at least is always to kind of amplify that experience and capability of the integrity team and integrity professional to remove kind of the the tedious and manual like data manipulation gathering data from multiple sources etc um you know i I'd, I'd think of it as like almost like having an assistant who can look through millions of anomalies all at once and kind of surface the ones that are most likely to need your attention as an integrity professional and give you all the context, the history, the related data, your CIS measurements, et cetera, already prepared and ready for you to make that that analysis, right? To do the, the real work yeah, yeah. that it's, requires it's that. Like, it's almost like, uh, I, you know, when you say that, I think of Jarvis from Iron Man, right? Yeah. So, you know get me this do that for me but at the end of the day iron man is the uh, sort of the hero and uh jarvis is sort of supporting and and uh able to get all that you know uh information look up anything he wants uh it's almost like it's a team effort right yeah you you still need tony stark at the end of the day that's right, right? That's, that's right, right. <laughs> yeah um you know i like Steve Jobs famously, like he, he referred to the computer as like a bicycle for our minds, right? Like meaning that it's a tool that can multiply the efficiency and capability of its user. And I kind of like to think that, uh, you know, with cognitive integrity management that, that we work on, we're kind of building that bicycle for, for the pipeline integrity world. Perfect, perfect. No doubt about it. So, at this point, uh, if you would, uh, if we can jump into the demo that you have there, sure. uh, cognitive integrity management. So yeah, if you could uh, please uh, show us a demo of that. Okay, great. So 
cognitive integrity management, again, it's a it's a pretty comprehensive suite that represents kind of the entire uh, integrity management life cycle that we talked about earlier. I'll try to focus on things that are kind of specifically relevant to the topics of data science and machine learning. Um, we can kind of start in the assessment planning module, and this is where um, we really introduce the idea of bringing data into the system, normalizing that data, preparing it for use for all kinds of downstream activities. So in the assessment planning module, uh, you can kind of plan, schedule, and execute all of your inspection activity. We support you know, your inline inspections, hydrostatic tests, direct assessment, various types of cathodic protection surveys, et cetera. Um, I'm going to jump into an inline inspection assessment that we have here. And this is effectively where you can begin to load your vendor data, so your ILI talent or vendor report into the system. Once you do that, it's going to kick off a kind of pipeline of machine learning, uh, algorithms, and, and things like that that will get applied to that data. And during that time, your inline inspection data will be aligned to anything that the system already understands and knows, the kind of internal representation of that pipeline, its history, its asset records from your GIS system, etc. So one of the things that that enables is that we then get to that kind of apples to apples data structure um, where we can look at what's changing over time, how have different vendors described this pipeline over time, etc. So one example of that is in our assessment summary report. Uh, I can go look at this system which has an assessment history going from uh, 2019 back to 2000 across five different inline inspection data sets. And you can see what's happening here is that we're showing the number of uh, anomalies that were reported by each vendor at each point in time, along with how cognitive integrity management has classified and understood these anomalies. So again, you know that across the different ILI vendor reports, there's lots of different ways that vendors will describe the same feature, et cetera. This is really about grouping those into a taxonomy that we can then use for alignment and for analysis and such. So you know, you can see under this corrosion wall loss section, there's lots of different ways that the vendor has described this, right? Corrosion, external corrosion, group, just metal loss, et cetera. And Cognitive integrity management understands that these are all different ways of saying kind of the same thing. We also preserve obviously all the attributes and properties about that anomaly, whether it was called as internal or external, whether it was clustered or unclustered, obviously it's dimensions, orientation, et cetera. But this is the foundation of normalizing data to be able to present it in this way um, and being able to kind of make those apples to apples comparisons and supporting things like alignment and, and deeper analysis. So from there, uh, we then have the ability to, to look at things like growth, like interacting threats where we have different feature types kind of at that same location on the pipeline. Say if you had a, a crack tool that reported a crack at some specific location, once things are spatially aligned together, we have the ability to kind of identify where we have metal loss from a different tool at that exact same location to look at how things are changing, etc. So one way that uh, we accomplish that is through what we call our growth analysis reporting. This is where we're taking the classified data, the aligned data, putting the pieces together to allow operators to make that comparison. So we can kind of give operators a, a very comprehensive summary of growth, you know, what's kind of happening broadly, as well as the ability to drill in on specific anomalies. So in this case, this is a ranked list of what cognitive integrity management would, would surface as the fastest growing anomalies, the ones with the most change over time. And you have the ability to kind of drill through into this information to, uh, you know, look at it, you know, in a very rich sort of data visualization uh, capability and see, you know, kind of what this looks like over time. So again, these are all different uh, different anomalies in different colors representing the inline inspection data set that they originated from. Each of those is a, you know, effectively a point in time by classifying those consistently, by identifying the patterns and adjusting for the odometer shift and orientation shift inherent in each of those ILI data sets, we're able to kind of put this into the same normalized space and then to put it here 
right for the operator to understand what's happening, what's changing over time. I can see kind of how this particular anomaly has been sized over time, whether it's changing, whether it's growing at all, uh, etc. So, so maybe so the does, uh, oh, sorry, sorry I was just gonna I was gonna say does cognitive uh, the CIM come with uh, uh, VR goggles as well <laughs> so that you can uh, rotate the pipe you know in front of you. It, it feels like that's the eventuality. So I, I will say Excellent. that at, uh, at PPIM uh, a couple of years ago, we showed off a proof of concept where, again, we partnered with Microsoft uh, to develop a small application for the HoloLens. So the HoloLens, yeah. for anyone not familiar, is an augmented reality headset where it's, it's not quite VR because you can see through it right into the real world. And what we right. showed there was uh, we had built a mock piece of pipe uh, and set it up at our booth at PPIM. PIM, and then we were overlaying your ILI data onto that mock pipe through the HoloLens. So you were kind of able to see, you know, this data set from 2000 all the way to 2019 overlaid on top of the physical pipe sitting right in front of you. There's some really powerful stuff when we start to think about the future of this type of technology in the industry. Perfect. Yes. Yep. So maybe I'll show one last thing if we uh, if we still have the time for it, and that sure, is sure. Uh, our pattern detection that we talked about earlier. So um, this is where you know again I mentioned the ability to look for things like potential coding disbondment, uh, etc. And just to show you an example of what that looks like, so these are some areas uh, in this report where we have a potential coding disbondment issue identified by the system. Hold on, let me go back to this one here. So again, these are areas where we have a you know kind of high concentration potentially of uh, metal loss, corrosion type anomalies in kind of the the zones of orientation that could indicate a coding failure. So again, what we typically see in this pattern is corrosion. You know, the so we're looking right now at the bottom of the pipe, right, 180 degrees right down the middle here, and what we're seeing here is is some increased corrosion kind of going up the sides from the bottom on the exterior of the pipe. So again, uh, this typically could indicate uh, some kind of coating failure where humidity and moisture is penetrating that coating and causing you know, this high kind of incidence of corrosion in this region. So again, gives you some idea of the types of opportunities that are available in these pattern detection algorithms, in machine learning models that this kind of thing, I think as you can appreciate, would be very difficult to find you know, with a, a human, you know, kind of looking for this pattern in an Excel sheet. Right, right. And then I, I can almost imagine that you can uh, overlay, let's say, CP data and say, oh, it lines up with the CP low as well, right? I, exactly. Yep, that's right. We have other reports where, you know, if you've loaded in your close interval survey data, et cetera, you can put your on and off voltages, your shift, uh, et cetera, right up against these anomalies. Again, aligning everything together, providing you that complete kind of data integration story. And put this stuff into context, right, is what it's all about in a way that, you know, just isn't, was never before possible. Yeah, and then that's back to the, like, the narrative, as we were saying. So let's say this pipeline, um, <clears throat> you know, with this manufacturer, and it has, you know, selective seam corrosion, and then maybe that sort of highlights it and says, oh, okay, this pipeline in this area always seems to have selective seam corrosion, and it looks like this. And perhaps that's because, you know, uh, the CP, you know, and maybe it's in a swamp area, you know, and, and the, the CP might not be effective, it's tape coated, so it kind of helps you build that narrative, correct? Yep, absolutely. And in fact, you know, if you'll allow me, you know, there's kind of one more example of this on sure, our sure. our potential uh, internal localized corrosion pattern, where, mm -hmm. you know, again, very similar to the despondent pattern, you can see in this case, this is internal corrosion, almost bottom dead center of the pipeline. And you can see like there's a lot of it here on this joint right. in particular and on the neighboring joints. And then, you know, you can do things like look at the map and you can see that, you know, this is in, you know, particularly kind of hilly terrain, et cetera. You can then plot elevation against these anomalies and you start to see that narrative that, oh, in these valleys, these low lying areas, you know, we have some kind of impurities pooling there. We have higher rates of in internal bottom side corrosion at those locations. So again, just a few examples of the really powerful things you can do with 
a tool that integrates all of your data, you know, that kind of integrity data system that is rich and complete, and then the higher level analytics that that supports. Right. So what are some of the, uh, one question before our final question here, uh, what are some of the uh, QC standards that exist? So how, how can uh, operators, you know, wh whether it's OneBridge or just in general, like uh, how can operators feel that, okay, you know, because then there's a lot of trust and a lot of uh, dependency that's built in, in, in the sense that, okay, now we're, let's say we're trusting, you know, OneBridge or, or whatever machine learning software to, um, you know, correctly align welds, to correctly display the corrosion features. Just on the background side or in the back back end, you know, what kind of QC features are there that ensure that, um, you know, there's good quality and checks that go on? Yeah, so I think there's a number of ways to think about that, right? And the you know the broad answer is that it's it's going to take time, right? It's going to take time for these technologies to you know kind of prove themselves in different industries, etc. And during that time, I think it's prudent to you know to evaluate them, you know, critically and to compare say the results of a purely machine learning or algorithmic approach to you know the kind of current state of the art, a more manual analysis, et cetera. And so that's kind of the process that we walk operators through as part of our production trial uh, engagement is, you know, let's understand how you're doing the job today, the analysis that your engineers are doing, et cetera. Let's stand up the cognitive integrity management system with your data and look at what kind of bubbles up from that. And then let's just compare and let's understand, you know, where those things overlap, where they diverge and why. I think that's a good way to think about it is to, you know, to kind of run the, the Pepsi challenge, so to speak, right? And to compare the output and results of a system like this with, you know, your existing results. And the interesting thing is you you then have the ability to kind of back test that. And you can say, okay, well, you know, what, what would the the tool have determined, uh, you know, in terms of growth rates or anomalies that might require attention, et cetera, versus decisions that were made over time. And we use that information to kind of refine and improve the process. So thanks for that, Jordan. Um, you know, why don't we end off here with the, you know, the same question I asked all my guests, the, you know, what is the vision? What is the future? What is the outlook? How do you see machine learning and data science evolve? And, uh, you know, is it is it by 2030 uh, we get the ILI information and then it just everything's done? <laughs> we just put it into one bridge. It does criteria digs, growth analysis. It lines up the wells. Like, is that going to happen one day? Or are we going to just be able to uh, drag and drop that Excel file in if it's still Excel, for example, and it just just develops everything for, everything for us? Oh, it, it seems like it'll be Excel forever. That that's a tool that just won't won't die, right? Um, but no, I mean I uh, I feel that the future of this is is clearly you know not working in Excel, uh, you know, and and juggling this data manually, etc. It's really about the tools, not necessarily making the decisions for you. You know, again, I, I personally don't foresee that, but I think it's about helping professionals make the best possible decisions with the least sort of time investment, et cetera, right? Uh, you know, just really elevating the work that's being done and making sure that, you know, everyone's time and expertise is being well utilized for the things that where, where it's most important, right? So to me, like the future of this is about more comprehensive machine learning models and tools, improved algorithms, bringing in more of that data, right? constructing that digital twin in higher and higher fidelity. So, you know, we, we talked about bringing in more of the CP data. Um, you know, our team is looking at things like SCADA and real-time data and all the opportunities to kind of augment and bring more data into the mix. Um, and then, you know, I think further out in the future, things like better data capture tools, right? Introducing electronic data capture into field operations, uh, things like the, the HoloLens that we mentioned, tools like that um, you know just gaining ubiquity and becoming more widely used in the field and and in the integrity office itself uh, tools like lidar you know being used to kind of scan anomalies and things like that in higher and higher resolution feeding that back into the models that kind of extract features out of raw signal data 
that kind of thing. Um, you know, another just interesting thing that I know is, is being worked on is things like using drones and IoT technology to do, you know, things like right of way surveys and then using machine learning again to analyze the imagery from the drone to help identify soil disturbances, uh, water pooling in the right of way, vegetation, those types of things. So I just think there's a ton of interesting things happening here. You know, the future is clearly to just integrate more and more data, pull it up to higher level analysis such that the engineers are are focused on, you know, where they can contribute the most with their expertise. Excellent. I have so many questions. I know we can we can uh, talk about this the whole day, but again, thank you so much. We've come up to the hour mark here. Uh, last two questions. First one, uh, if people want to learn more about uh, data science and machine learning and specifically OneBridge, uh, if you can share your contact information with everyone, we'll put it in the uh, sort of in the footer below, as well as I know you were also mentioning before we discuss uh, before we start our discussion here that uh, OneBridge and just in general, the industry is uh, looking to expand. So maybe if you can uh, uh, give us a pitch for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the best place to go is one, onebridgesolutions.com. Um, we also have a presence on Twitter and uh, most of the social media stuff. You can always reach us at, I believe it's info at onebridgesolutions.com or just through the website. Um, I mentioned a couple conference papers and things like that that we published if you want to check out uh, and read more about how uh, things like repair fraction, which is again the, you know, the percentage of digs that are productive versus unproductive and how things like machine learning can be applied to try to optimize for a particular outcome, etc. And then, as you mentioned, our team is growing. We're always looking to, to meet and to bring on the best and brightest of the industry. Um, you know, obviously, we have, uh, you know, we're, we're really focused on investing in, you know, kind of the data side of our company, data science, data analysis, etc. Um, but we're also always looking for integrity engineers and people, you know, more doing doing the type of work that we're looking to support with our solution. So if anybody out there in among your viewers is looking for their next opportunity, is interested in working on these kinds of, you know, if I'm if I may say so, cool problems to work on, uh, we'd love to hear from you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, definitely exciting stuff. Uh futuristic stuff, no doubt about it. Again, uh, Jordan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Hussein. I, I loved it. Thanks. Great. Take care. Yep, you too. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. And until next time, keep on pigging, digging, repair a coating, and backfilling. Take care.